Come on in, it's Bible class time. It's Bible class time. Come on in. It's time for our weekly uh, Bible study time. Come on in and share with us. We had a little technical difficulty, but we are back online now. So come on, share with us. Uh, let's have some Bible class. Come on and share with us. Got a good lesson this week. Got a good lesson this week. I'm praying that you all uh, will tune in to this one and that it blesses you. We're going to look at uh, Psalm 51 this week. Uh, in, this, in this season, I think we need to take a, a moment and kind of look at what the Lord has to say about the high cost of sin. And so I want you all to come on with us. Hey, Jen, how you doing? Uh, come on in with us. We're going to jump into this lesson uh, real quickly here. Uh, the Lord shared something with me um, that I think will be a blessing to all of us. And, uh, and so you all come and share with us real quickly uh, as we look at this lesson. Psalm 51 is where we're going to be tonight. Psalm 51. Uh, we're going to talk about it tonight. So come on and join with us. Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is our lesson for tonight. And so I want you all to kind of jump in with us as we take a look um, at what I want, at the uh, high cost of sin. The high cost of sin. So come on and jump in here with us. Uh, you all know how I, I like to do um I, I love to start with prayer and uh, I always like to end with prayer. And uh, I want you to do something for me if by chance uh, you have uh, somebody that needs to, uh, you want to pray for, uh, let me know. Sister Marion, how you doing? Uh, glad to see you on here with us. Oh, Mama Gant watching. I guess we got to get some work done tonight. Um so I want you to kind of let me know those uh, family members and friends that you may have uh, that we need to petition God for. Um, it's been so many people who have been affected by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And so I want to uh, make sure that we whisper a word of prayer for them before we leave. And so uh, I want you all to make sure you uh, send me your uh, prayer requests. You can just drop their names. Uh, you can send them to me in Messenger uh, so that when we go to God that we can uh, say prayers for them. Um, so many people being affected and uh, we certainly want to keep them uh, lifted in prayer. If you got your Bible in front of you, I want you to take a look at Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is where we're going to be tonight. And uh, for those of you who have spent any time in the Bible, uh, this is not unfamiliar territory for us, uh, but I just believe that we should not allow the familiarity of it uh, rob us of what the Lord has to say to us on tonight. And so you all grab Psalm 51. Uh, this is a familiar passage. This is uh, David's prayer of repentance. And uh, it's in here that we find some powerful keys to prayer that we all need to take a look at. Uh, so many of us uh, don't realize that uh, at some point uh, you're going to have to tell the Lord that uh, you need him to forgive you uh, for, for acts and actions. Bless you, Pastor Gowdy. Good to see you, man. Uh, blessings to you. So Psalm 51, we're going to talk about the high cost of sin. So we're going to talk about tonight the high cost of sin. So let's pray and we're going to, we're going to jump into this lesson. God, our Father, we thank you again for giving us another day and chance and privilege to connect with these, your people. We certainly ask, God, that you would bless this time together. God, allow us to see you and to hear you, feel your presence. And God, allow us to leave here better than the way we came. God, give us something fresh and new uh, for the ears and spirits of your people, uh, that it may be a blessing to them and they be better for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And so watch this, Psalm 51. We're going to talk about uh, the high cost of sin. And I know, I know we going through enough and uh, you might think that we already got enough to deal with uh, without talking about sin, but I don't want you to think 
that just because, Brother Chris, how you doing? I don't want you to think that just because uh, you quarantined in your house, that sin ain't still taking place. And so uh, at some point, you're going to have to talk about it uh, to God. And so we're going to talk about how to handle it. Okay, Psalm 51, grab it real quick. Watch this, Psalm 51. This is David's uh, prayer of repentance unto God. Uh, it is uh, David's words after uh, the prophet Nathan has come to him uh, and prophesied unto him, telling him, uh, and he gave it to him in a nice little parable after David had uh, taken Bathsheba unto himself. Uh, the prophet Nathan comes to remind David and shows him in a very unique way. Uh, he says uh, that, that there is nothing that God does not see. And I need you all to catch this. If you want the backstory, it's in 2 Samuel chapter number 12, uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 12, where you find the backstory to this, where Nathan comes to David and uh, reveals unto David a ter terrible tragedy that takes place. And he uses the parable of one man who has many sheep and one man who has one wee little lamb. And he gives this background story and says, the man that had the many sheep, he threw a party. And instead of using one of his own sheep, he goes to his neighbor's house who has one sheep and he takes his sheep and uh, he slaughters it and serves it to the party goers. And uh, David is angry. He is frustrated. He is downright mad. Uh, he tells Nathan, who is he? Uh, he going to pay and, and, and you know, we going we gonna to make sure we get out of him what he owes back to this man and then he's going to pay for it. And Nathan tells David, you are that man. And it's in this text uh, that you see the response to David finding out that it's him uh, who's caught in the sin. And, and so watch this. All of us have had moments where we have been caught red-handed uh, in our wrongdoing. And, uh, and this, this uh, particular psalm lets us know, and I want you to hear me, uh, that a secret sin on earth is a open scandal in heaven. I want you to kind of hear me when I tell you this. Uh, there is no secret sins. I love you too, Elon. There is no secret sins when it comes to God, the Bible says, Proverbs 15 and 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding both the evil and the good, which lets us know that there is no secrets when it comes to God. There's no secrets uh, in, in what we do and how we do and what we think that we're getting away with. Uh, God knows he just chooses when to reveal unto you that he knows what you're doing. And so, uh, I don't want you to think that you're going to get away uh, with anything with God because the secret sin is an open scandal in heaven. And, and Nathan exposes unto David that God knows everything that David has done. And Nathan's revelation to David uh, shatters David's defense. I, I want you to catch this. Uh, David... Uh, was angry and had his defense up. He was ready to go on the offense to this man who Nathan has told him this story. And, and what happens is uh, through Nathan's revelation, it shatters David's defense and it initiates David's repentance. I need you to catch this. Uh, we, we go through steps in, in our lives and how we do and how we act. And, and oftentimes we go from defensive to defenseless uh, when, when, we, when we sin. We go from being defensive. When people confront us about what we've done, you ever notice uh, one of the first things that we do is get defensive. We get mad. No, I didn't. That wasn't me. You can't prove it and all of this stuff. And then when the facts are made known, we go from defensive to defenseless. And in David's case, when Nathan lays out to him that he does in fact know what David has done uh, uh, concerning uh, his sin with Bathsheba, David goes from defensive to defenseless. And the beauty of this is uh, you have to be humbled before your repentance can be true. 
I need you to catch it because it's a whole lot of people that will pray to God for forgiveness and they will do it and they don't even have a, a, a repentant spirit. They'll ask God for forgiveness and don't even mean it. They'll just say it so that they can say that they pray to God about what we're going through and what they've done. And they, I ask God for forgiveness. I don't know why God has not forgiven me yet. Well, it could be uh, that the reason God has not forgiven you yet is because you were not sincere in your asking of his forgiveness. And so what happens is uh, David goes from defensive to defenseless. And, and watch this. When he could no longer defend his actions, uh, it, it initiated his humility, which then initiated true repentance. I, I hope you heard what I just said. He, it, it initiates his humility. Uh, you do know that circumstances have to knock you down a, a few racks before you can, you know, really go to God the right way. Some of us are struggling because we go to God thinking we can look God in the face. We go to God thinking that we eye to eye with God. And, and, the, and the reality of this is uh, we're, we're really not grown enough uh, to, to see God face to face. We, we really truly cannot handle looking him in the eye. And so life has a way and even our sins have a way uh, of knocking us down so that humility uh, overrides our arrogance. Woo, I wish y'all catch this tonight. And so wa watch this. Uh, David has to be uh, humble uh, before he can really initiate real and relevant repentance. David is humbled. He is uh, brought down back into his right level uh, and, and it is there that, that he is able to initiate true repentance. And so watch this. We're going to catch it, right? Psalm 51, uh, going into verse 1. Uh, it is here that we figure out some, some, some real things because uh, David, uh, before he can get into all of his formalities of his prayer, uh, the first thing is that he says is, have mercy upon me. O oh God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude uh, of your tender mercies. And, and, and so D David realizes in order for him to even make it through uh, this repentive prayer, he first needs God's mercy upon him uh, so that he is able to even approach God the right way with the right words. And so uh, David knows that, that, that everything that he's done is out in the open. He, he can no longer hide it. Uh, and so he needs God's mercy in handling him and handling his sin. It says, he, have mercy upon me, God, according to your loving kindness. He, he knows that God loves him. He knows uh, that there is an abundance of love. And he even says, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. And this is powerful because uh, God has more mercy than we have sin. And David was aware of that, but but he, he uh, to move in a manner uh, that uh, what he said next would truly be heard unto God. He knew that there was no way that he could go to God with the same attitude that he had before and he needed God to move on his behalf uh, so that his humility is heard even more than his voice. And so David says, have mercy upon me. He says, with, with your loving kindness, according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies. God, I know you're merciful and you have more mercy than I have sin, but my sin is serious. And, and because my sin is serious, God, I need your mercy to override the severity of my sin. This is powerful because he's admitting uh, of his sin uh, and, and he uses a word uh, that, that most of us have said but have not really realized how powerful it is. Uh, David says, uh, he says, blot out my uh, transgressions 
and this is powerful because trans transgression literally translates into uh, me stepping over the line. I need you to catch it. David realizes that this particular sin is no ordinary sin. There is something severe uh, in this adulterous affair that he has allowed himself to be aligned with. And because it's so severe, he realizes that he has crossed the line that was made through the bonds of marriage. Uh, and so he asked God uh, to remove it, blot out. Blot blotting is a, a powerful term. If you know anything about cleaning, uh, blotting is not scrubbing, uh, but blotting is a pressing. It's almost like you spill something on the carpet and you get your towel and you don't start scrubbing it with the towel, but you'll get the towel and you'll start pressing in uh, to the Kool-Aid that you spilled, to the to the pop that you spilled. And, and the towel in the pressing allows the towel to absorb the stain before it sets in. I need you to catch what I'm saying. And so God, David asked God uh, to blot out his, his uh, overstepping of the boundaries that God has set. And he says, not only do I want you to forgive me, bless you, Sister Hickman, not only do I want you to forgive me, but remove this sin, blot out this sin uh, before it stains my soul. He says, blot out uh, my sin. He, he says, bless, press it down. Bless you, brother Ryan. He says, uh, uh, press down uh, upon my sin so that it will not stain my soul. Catch this now. He says, uh, I, I've overstepped, uh, uh, I've stepped over the line that you've drawn, God, and I understand uh, that my sin is serious. Uh, and, and, and not only, and catch this now, because not only uh, did David commit adultery, but David also lied and committed murder uh, all in one fell swoop. And so God, he knows that this is not going to be an ordinary instance for God because see, most of us just lie. Uh, some people just cheat. Uh, some people have just committed murder. Uh, but what David is saying is I've done all three and these three things are major uh, in God's eyesight. And, and because I'm not God and I don't have the authority uh, to take someone else's life, I really need God to move on my behalf and don't let the severity of my sin stain my soul. And so he says, I need you to block out this sin from me. This is, this is powerful. See, most of us don't realize uh, that that all those sins seems soothing, that there is a high cost for our sinful ways, our sinful acts, and our sinful manners. Uh, and so this is powerful because this shows us that sin is not free. Sin is not free. And although it seems as though you may have gotten away with it, the Lord is still keeping a tally of your sin. And so David says, before you even count this, I need you to forgive me for before it even sets in, be, before it begins to stain uh, my soul, I need you to move on my behalf and block out this particular sin. This is powerful uh, because he knows how messed up he is. He recognizes that his sinful acts is a direct rebellion against God and who he is uh, so much so that he literally begins to beg God in his prayer, have mercy upon me according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. And then watch this. Not, I, I not only need your loving kindness, I also need your mercy. And then he goes on to say, blot out my transgressions. And then this, this, this gets good because uh, he's asked God to blot out the transgression. He's already asked God uh, to press upon him and, and then absorb the sin from him. And, and this is powerful because uh, you all know this, uh, God uh, is sinless and, and God knows no sin upon himself. Uh, and David is asking of God in the blotting that he would not just take it away, but that he would literally absorb the sin 
off of him. This is this is powerful. Uh, you, this is why I always say you got to be careful what you pray for. You got to know what it is you're saying and asking. And David is asking God to absorb what is foreign to him to take it away from David. This, this He says, I need you to blot out uh, my transgressions. And then watch this by the time he gets to verse number two, he asks God to go from blotting out the transgressions uh, to then washing him uh, thoroughly. This is powerful. Wash me thoroughly uh, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Watch this. Uh, he, he says, God, I don't need the quick cycle of washing. I, I don't want that, that, that light cycle. I don't want the delicate cycle uh, in, your, in your washing. I need uh, the, the heavy duty cleaning. He says, I need you to truly wash me thoroughly. And, and watch this. Uh, you, you've washed your clothes before and, and pulled them out of the washing machine and looked at them because you knew that you spilled something uh, on this blouse or shirt or pants or what have you. And, and when you pulled it out the washing machine, the first thing you did was looked at it to see if the stain had set in. David realizes that a light wash was not going to remove the stain. He says, I'm asking you to blot it. And then when you blot it out of me, turn around and wash me. So the residue of the sin is no longer on me. I wish y'all was catching this and getting as happy as I am uh, because D David recognizes the, again, the severity of his sin and he does not want the sin to leave a stain and a stench on his soul. God, I should have just waited to preach this on Sunday. This is powerful. He says, I, I don't want you uh, to just take it away from me, but God, I need you to remove the residue of the sin off of me. Did you catch what I just said? He says, I need you to not only block the sin off of me, but I need you to then wash me thoroughly so that the leftovers won't be evident in my life. He says, wash me uh, thoroughly. And, and, and this is powerful because it's some folk that want God to blot out, but don't want God to wash them. Catch what I just said. It's some people that want God to blot the sin out of their life. Uh, God, remove it from me. Re absorb it off of me so folk won't see my scarlet letter. Uh, but they don't want God to in turn wash the remainder of the sin off of them. You do know uh, that you can sober up and still look drunk. You can, you, you can, you can have, you know, you, you went from being drunk to just being buzzed, but the remnants of the alcohol is still on you. This is why I struggle with people who smoke weeds. I tell them all the time, uh, you think just because you sprayed some Febreze on yourself and you had some air freshener in your car, you do know when you get out, the remnant is still on you and people can still smell everything you just did. So not only do you need God uh, to blot out the sin from you, but you still need God to wash you afterward so that the remnants of the sin, I'm about to get happy, is not still evident in your life. Can I tell you something? It's a reason why a uh, folk can't really tell you're as messed up as you are and it's not because of anything you did. It's because God blotted and then washed you. He blotted the sin out of you and then he washed you afterward. So when you got to church the next day, folk couldn't tell you spent the night sinning before. I wish you'd catch this. It's a reason why I see people always talk about, I don't look like what I've been through. And, and, and to some people, it's a joke. I don't look like what I've been through. I don't look like what I've been through. But tell the truth. You don't look like it because God removed it from you. It's not that you did any work in regards to how you look or how you appear. It's not that you did any work. All you did was ask God to handle it and he responded. 
I need you to catch it. You, 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 you ain't been that good to God. You ain't that holy. Some of us are so messed up that messed up is just our lifestyle. And it's not that we've been so good to God that we don't look like what we've been through. Some of us just got good genes. But the reality of it is we don't look like our sin because God blotted and then he washed us. David says, wash me thoroughly. He says, wash me thoroughly. He said, I don't need the delicate wash. He said, God, I need you to get down in it. See, the washing me thoroughly indicates that David is inviting God to come on the inside of him so that he can really handle, watch this, not so much the physical aspect of his sin, but to handle the spiritual aspect of David's life. David was not in the best space uh, uh, spiritually. Remember now, some time had passed uh, by time uh, David uh, uh, and, and, and Nathan had this conversation. Study reveals just about a year has passed uh, before, before Nathan comes to tell David that he knows what happens. And the Bible says uh, that that th by this time, the child that Bathsheba was carrying, she had gave birth to. And so and so time had passed and David seemingly had got away with what he had done only for God to send the man of God by his house as a reminder that God sees David was messed up and it was not physically visible, but he was messed up on the inside. And so what David begins to ask God is, once you block out the sin, I need you to wash me so my insides would reflect the outside. I look like on the outside what I'm supposed to then. Uh, it, it, it won't be a facade. I won't have to wear, you know, wear the mask of happiness and the, and the mask of peace uh, because God will have moved so that, that you will literally be happy. You will be peaceful. You won't have to wear the mask because God has moved in your life. Watch this. David says, uh, he says, wash me uh, thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This, this iniquity word uh, is powerful uh, uh, because iniquity means literally to twist or pervert something. And so remember now, David's sin was multifaceted. And so not only did he take Bathsheba for himself uh, and, and, and have an affair with her, uh, but he then uh, starts bothering Bathsheba's husband brought him home, tried to get him uh, to go home and sleep with Bathsheba to cover up the sin that he had committed. And when it did not work one time, it did not work two times, he realized then uh, Uriah was not going uh, home to enjoy the pleasantries of his wife because his fellow brother was still on the front line fighting battle, defending the country. And watch this, when he realizes it, David gives Uriah a letter and sends him back to war and puts in the letter to put him on the front line uh, so that he'll go ahead and die in battle. And see, this is powerful. This is where uh, this iniquity comes from because David twists and perverts uh, both Uriah and Bathsheba's lives. It takes them out of the norm that they were living and he, he literally changes uh, the outcome of their life. He takes Bathsheba unto himself. He sends Uriah back to war. Uriah dies uh, in war. And then he takes uh, Bathsheba uh, as his own wife. And, and this is uh, powerful uh, and yet strange. Uh, at the same time, uh, because it lets us know that there are some individuals who will go to some extreme lengths to keep you from knowing how messed up they are. And David, in this moment of clarity, uh, in this moment of, of understanding of where he really was, uh, David asked God, to, to forgive him. Now, remember, he asked God for his forgiveness for stepping over the line. And now he's saying, God, forgive me for literally twisting and perverting uh, this marriage that I've destroyed. 
And so uh, a study says God gave mankind the beautiful gifts of sex within marriage and truth and loyalty. And David distorted all of these things so that he himself can be pleased. This, this, is, this is powerful. So David recognizes how much he has messed up. And so he says, God, I crossed the line. Forgive me for that, God. Uh, I have uh, perverted uh, uh, these people's lifestyle uh, in my iniquities. He says, so please forgive me, uh, wash me for that. And then he turns around uh, in verse number two, latter part of verse number two, he says, and cleanse me from my sin. This, this is powerful because, uh, because we've talked about uh, the blotting. We, we've, we've talked about uh, then the washing thoroughly. And then David uh, goes from blotting to washing to cleansing. And so, and so this cleansing translates into purify. Uh, purify me, he says. And, 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 and it's a, a twist on words because he turns around and says, uh, cleanse me, he said, of my sin. And so catch this because he's the sin literally means to miss the mark is, is what this particular uh, sin translates into. And he asked God uh, to, to forgive him, to cleanse him uh, for missing uh, God's target of what his life uh, should have been. David recognized uh, that his sin not only affect him, but his sin has affected other people. And so he realizes now that he really has some work to do uh, in this repented prayer. And see, remember I told you now, this is the high cost of sin. Uh, and so David recognizes that it's gonna take more than the Lord forgive me to handle this. You're gonna have to dig into what you've really done and what you're really doing and going through. And so David, uh, he deals with this inch by inch. And I gotta give it to David because David recognized that it was going to take something more, something extra. It was gonna take some digging deep. It was gonna take some true repentance. It was gonna take him truly being honest with God, uh, being sincere uh, with God, being real in his repentance for God to hear and answer his prayers. And, and David understood that, that his sin not only stained him, but his sin stained the lives of both Uriah and Bathsheba. And so he has to talk to God, not just for him, but he has to talk to God for on their behalf as well. And so watch this. David uh, recognizes now every, everywhere he looked, his sin was in front of him. And, 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 uh, and while many uh, uh, seem to ignore, overlook, look past uh, uh, our sin and sinful ways and sinful lifestyles, David recognized the only way that he was going to find some peace in the midst of this mess was that David had to be sincere and he had to take the blinders off. Let me, let me kind of just pause real quickly in here uh, because some of us have been living in sin and living sinful lives for so long that we're literally walking around with sinful vision. So much so that the stuff that we do don't even feel bad no more. It don't even seem wrong no more. It don't even seem like we messing up anymore because it has become second nature to us. It, it has become a way of life. Matter of fact, and I dare to say it this way, our sinful ways have become religious to us. And don't misconstrue the word. The word religious just means to do out of routine. And so David's sinful ways have become routine for him, have become religious for him. David could not even see the truth for the sin has blinded him. And so David recognizes that he has to take the sinful blinders off. He recognizes that sin uh, begins to affect him in different ways. And by the time you kind of jump down, I'm kind of moving a little fast. Uh, by the time he gets down to like verse six, uh, he starts talking about how sin has uh, affected his thinking. 
he 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 has he realizes uh, that the way that he has operated has skewed his thinking so much so that God's way no longer seems right but his own way uh, is what seems right. And, and watch this, anytime you begin to question you, the steps that you're taking, and anytime you begin to question if these ways are right or wrong based upon God's word and his will and his way, chances are you have begun to switch roles with God so much so that your way of thinking and living will supersede God's will and his word. And so David recognizes uh, that his sin has messed up his way of uh, thinking. And, and he says in the latter part of verse six, he said in the hidden part, uh, in the hidden part, you know, to make me know wisdom. David recognizes that the way that he has been living is not wise, nor is it in the will of God. And he says, God, I need you to really kind of, kind of cover me right now. Help me now so that the way that I think again becomes the way that you want me to think. David realizes that sin affects his way of thinking. And David, uh, it says he had tried replacing God's truth with his own lie. Matter of fact, David's sinfulness uh, made him uh, rationalize his sin. And, and let me share this with you real quickly. You, you do know that the, that, that the devil wants you to believe that your sins are little sins. They're not major sins. They're not going to harm you. Uh, you'll be able to get by. The Lord will still forgive you. Uh, you know, he tell you stuff like the Lord know your heart. Remember, you know, God know my heart. And, and the struggle that we begin to face is, we keep saying because God know our heart uh, as almost as an excuse for us to continue the way that we live. And can I tell you something? God does know your heart, which is why you should strive harder uh, to please him. And so watch this. That David, uh, who was living in this form of spiritual insanity, uh, realizes he's not thinking correctly. Uh, he realized that not only did the sin uh, affect his thinking, but by the time he gets to verse number eight, he realizes that the sin has begun uh, to affect his hearing. Look at verse number eight. He says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. I need you to catch it. David recognizes uh, that he could not uh, even hear or could not experience and feel uh, the joy uh, of God in his life anymore. Matter of fact, study says uh, that David had become uh, physically sick uh, during the time that he had lived with this unconfessed sin in his life, uh, but but uh, David still tried to continue to move on, although the sin was greatly affecting him. He still strived to keep moving and keep pushing and keep going although the sin was really overtaking him, uh, so much so that David almost could not function because the sin was overriding him. And David recognized that he needed God to move upon his mind so that he may think straight. He needed God to move upon his ears so that he may hear him clearly. And then watch this. David recognizes that his sin had began to affect his heart and his spirit. That's why by the time he gets to verse number 10, which is everybody's favorite verse, he starts saying stuff like, create within me a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit within me. Uh, he starts, and, and this is powerful again, because uh, you need these things. Please, God, you know, uh, a sin uh, is to the heart what dirt is to the body. Uh, and, and so David recognized that his heart uh, did not look right in God's eyes. His heart was scarred. It was covered uh, it, with, with, with the stains of sin. And, and so much so that he knew uh, that he was going to have to maneuver some stuff around in order for the Lord to truly hear him. And David is wise enough to know that he cannot handle his sinful ways on his own. So much so that he begins to ask God to create within him a clean heart. Now, remember, 
He'd already talked about, God, I need you uh, to blot out this. I need you uh, to wash me. I need you to cleanse me. But David also knew that he had to get uh, specific uh, because if you remember uh, uh, in the text, uh, you, you've seen it with the prodigal son and things of that nature. We'll start talking about the sin I've sinned within my heart, uh, meaning that I purposed in my heart to do this, knowing uh, that it's with our heart that we truly please God. And so uh, it's not with our thoughts as much as it is with our actions. Our actions comes from uh, the heart. David recognizes uh, that his heart was not in the right shape for, for him to even use it for God. And he asked God to create within him a clean heart. This is, this is the thing. It's tragic uh, because, because we, we live so long uh, with dirty hearts uh, and, and, and unclean spirits uh, that we get used to living hypocritical lives that we begin to judge how other people think and how they live and how they do, not recognizing that we're living very similar lives to the same individuals that we are trying to cast judgment upon. And David says, he recognizes uh, that we cannot be spiritual if we don't have the right spirit and the right heart within us. He says, create within me a clean heart, restore unto me of uh, the right spirit. David recognized something powerful that I hope y'all catch this when I say it. David says uh, that that not only does the sin uh, uh, affect my mind, it affects my hearing, it, it affects my way of thinking, it affects uh, my heart. Uh, he says it affects our body. But watch this. Sin affects your testimony. David is all is identified by many scholars and theologians as a man after God's own heart. And here he is misusing the very heart that God has given unto him uh, so much so that he has to ask God to give him a clean one. He he don't even realize how messed up he is in this thing. Uh, and so he, he he catches himself in his acts. He said, God created within me a clean. I restore unto me uh, the right spirit. Watch this. Uh, because he realizes that without the right spirit, that his testimony has no power. You got to remember, D David uh, was so known for, for being blessed and covered by God and all that he did and all that he was able to do. And David recognizes uh, my testimony is, is meaningless uh, if I'm still living a sinful life. If I'm, if, if, if I have sin uh, staining and covering my soul, uh, then how can I truly have a real testimony? Ever notice uh, people that have been through a lot and have gone through a lot, been saved and, and, and redeemed through a lot, uh, they have powerful testimonies. Uh, but if they go back to what the Lord has redeemed them from, it almost silences the power of their testimony. And, and, and David uh, lets us know and reminds us that the longer we live in sin, the further away from God that we get. So much so that we become spiritually unrecognizable to God, which is why David had to ask for a clean heart. He needed to ask God for a right spirit within him. Watch this. David learned the hard way uh, that, that it's some costs to living a sinful life. I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, you, you all know, like I know you, you may have lived one way before the Lord redeemed you uh, and, and put you in the lane that you're living right now. Uh, but all of us should be able to attest, looking back retrospectively, uh, that our sin was expensive. Think about it now. I, uh, uh, some of our sins have, have caused us to lose jobs. Some of our sins have caused us to lose families. We've, we've lost spouses uh, uh, and families over our lives and over, over our sinful ways and sinful manners. Uh, our sins are expensive. It's a high cost to continue to live a sinful life when salvation is offered to you for free. God dog, David says, uh, it's cost me enough already. God, I need you um, to, to, to maneuver and move uh, not just up on me, but God, I need you to move within me. See, see the, 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 the washing and the blotting that, that David was asking, the cleansing that David was asking God for, 
uh, it was uh, so that his appearance would be one way. Uh, but then when God starts talking about the create within me, the clean heart and restore the right spirit, David then focuses on the spiritual aspect so that his outward appearance would not be a facade to those who are watching, but that his inside and his outside would match. And so his face would not be lying on his heart. And so David asked God to make sure that his spirit and his outward appearance lines up. So David, David asked this thing. We got we got to get up out of here momentarily, but I want to just kind of catch you up on this. David, that David says some things that were powerful. It's a high cost of committing the sin. It's a high cost of confessing uh, the sin. Because confession of, of sin and, and true confession uh, makes you uh, truly take a look at yourself. And this is the thing that, that we really uh, need to really uh, pay attention to. Uh, most of us cannot be honest in our confession uh, and even our asking of God for forgiveness because we won't even uh, you know, admit that we're sinners or we won't even admit that we live these lives of sin. We won't even admit Admit that sin has overtaken us and that we don't even know how we're going to come out of this thing tomorrow. And so David makes this powerful because he reminds us uh, uh, that this thing is powerful. David says uh, it's a lot because we truly have to be honest with ourselves uh, that we are are sinners. We see, see, so, some of us are struggling because we know that we've sinned, but we won't admit that we've sinned. We do stuff when, 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 when sin is presented to us, we start saying stuff like, yeah, but so-and-so do it. Or, or yeah, this person, but what about this person who's doing that? Can I tell you something? The, the moment that the Lord calls your name, calls your number, uh, and, and judgment day comes upon us, you better, it will not matter uh, what somebody else has done. Uh, it will only matter the life that you've lived. And, and so you have to take responsibility for your sin now and, and ask God to help you deal with it, forgive you for it, uh, and, and, and put you back in the right spirit and the right mind frame, restore unto you these things uh, so that when you face God on judgment day, you won't be worried about what anybody else has done. Can I tell you something? Your sin don't affect me like that. My sin don't affect you like that. God keeps track of all of our sins individually. Matter of fact, my pastor used to tell us something uh, years ago when we first started preaching. We were young preachers and we would be in the office and preachers meeting. And my pastor would say stuff like sin on your own. Uh, don't don't involve nobody else uh, in your sin. And it's a whole lot of people uh, that want to pour others in so that we won't be miserable by ourselves. That old saying misery loves company is true. That's why when you go to mess up, you include other people in your mess up instead of just doing it yourself. Watch this. D David recognizes uh, that sin uh, is a spiritual matter. Uh, which is why uh, he asked God to deal with his spirit. Uh, one one theologian says uh, that sin is is a slap in the face to God and confession is not just saying a little prayer or shedding a few tears. But when we confess our sins, uh, not only do we confess them, but we abandon them. And this is this is what makes this thing so powerful. I hope this lesson is all coming together for you now, uh, because if you truly want to confess of your sins, that means that you have no intention of revisiting those sins again. And so, see, some of us, uh, you know, we say this stuff, God, forgive me for what I've done. Oh, please, God, look upon me and all that stuff. And 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 not real, you know, not really being honest enough to admit uh, that we truly have a desire to go back to doing what we're asking God to deliver us from. That's not true confession. Uh, true con and, and I'll break it down to you this way. Uh, my mama told me some years ago that it's a difference between saying I'm sorry and I apologize. 
It's a difference because because saying that you're sorry is saying that you're sorry for what you've done. But saying that you apologize means not only are you sorry, but you have no intention of doing that again. And that's what confession is. See, uh, an apology is an admittance uh, that you were wrong in your deed, in your word, in your action. And you have no intention of committing this same sin again. This is why there are so many individuals who have not truly confessed their sins to God because they're, they're, they're telling God what they did, but they're still planning on doing it again. And true confession of sin means I have no intention of indulging in this same sin again. David says uh, that, that, that I, I'm abandoning, and this is why sin costs, and, and I want you all to kind of pay attention to what we're saying. Sin costs because you got to give up something to do it, but sin also costs uh, because you have to give them up at some point. Oh, but watch this. Watch this. Da David David, David uh, paints this picture uh, with his sins, uh, his, and he asks God uh, to essentially wipe his slate uh, clean, uh, but, but, but David uh, does not want... Um, uh, it went, by the time he started saying stuff like purge me and things like that, I want you to kind of catch it around verse seven. Uh, D David uh, is asking God to make sure that his sin does not contaminate his soul. This is why this is powerful. I, I wanted to mention this early and I kind of skipped by it, but I want to say it before we get up out of here. David says, I, I need you, God, to purge me uh, because I don't want my sin to contaminate my soul. And, and, and what most people don't realize, and I kind of mentioned it before, but it bears repeating again, a sin can be addictive and it becomes repetitive so much so that sin consumes your way of thinking and living and sin will ultimately contaminate your lifestyle. And if we're not careful, st sin will stain our soul. And so he says, uh, uh, I need you to purge me. He says, because I don't want what I've done uh, to 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 uh, uh, keep me from being able to see you one day in a pleasant way. And so David concludes his prayer uh, by asking God to restore uh, the joy of his salvation upon him again. Um, let me translate it real quickly. David, uh, not only did he, he didn't want his sin uh, to, to keep him from having relationship with God, but watch this, David desired to be used by God again. And, and David understood that you can only truly worship God in spirit and in truth, but you have to be joy. You have to have joy within you to truly worship God. It, when, when, when you think about God and when you really uh, pursue your true worship and service unto God, it should be done so with joy in your heart. And David understood that it was going to be too much for him to try to figure out a way to worship God uh, with sorrow. And so David said, uh, God, if you restore the joy of your salvation unto me, then you can use me. I will again be usable uh, by you. Let me just throw this out there so, so we'll catch this and to kind of recap this all. Uh, God can't truly use us in our messed up state. God, God can't get the best out of us if we're, if we're still living sinful, if, if we're still living in the messes that we've made. God cannot use our bruised and battered spirits. God cannot use our sin-stained soul. God, God cannot use us if we are not in a usable condition. And David recognized in order for him to be usable again, God would have to restore him spiritually to a point to where he's usable, he's recognizable uh, in God's eyes that he could be used. So David uh, does not want the sin to no longer affect him, but he also does not want his sin uh, to affect the people uh, that he was in charge of. Uh, and so David lets us know that it's too much for us uh, to attempt uh, to keep trying to, to, to live for God uh, and live in sin 
at the same time. And so David asked God to restore him and to replace him back into where he was so that he can do uh, what he was brought out to do. Watch this. Uh, verse 13. I, I promise I, I got to get out of here because we, we pass our time. Uh, D- David says in verse uh, 12 and 13, he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation up, uh, and uphold me by your generous spirit. He says, then will I teach other transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted unto you. Remember now, uh, David uh, used the word transgression in verse number three. Uh, remember, he used ver- transgression, verse number three, uh, meaning, remember, I told you transgression, meaning uh, that he stepped over the line. He crossed the line that God had made. And so David says, others uh, who cross this same line, others who have done this same thing, uh, I, I'll be able to, to teach and share with them what I have went through. And I need you to catch this. I need you to catch this. My pastor told me this probably uh, about 10, 12 years ago. Now uh, I had went to him and I was asking him why was, was, was uh, God allowing so many things to hit me? Why was God allowing me to go through so much? I was preaching. I was teaching. I was trying to lead best as I could. I considered myself a good servant. I, I was doing all that God had called me to do. I was tithing and serving. I was singing in the choir and directing the choir and playing the drums. I was on pastor support uh, ministry. I was going to every Bible study and teaching when I was supposed to. I was going to Bible class and Sunday school and paying my tithes and my offerings. And I did not understand why when it seemed like I was doing everything that God had called me to do, I was still being so heavily attacked by the devil and it seemed like God was allowing it to happen. I'm telling you this conversation that I had and and, and man, I was in my pastor's office with tears in my eyes because I could not get out of what I was in. I did not know why it seemed like it was open season in my life. Everything was being attacked. My family was being attacked. My job was being attacked. My finances were being attacked. Everything, my car was falling apart. Everything that it seemed like I needed was going just straight to the dumps. And I remember being in my pastor's office, tears in my eyes, trying to ask him, why is God doing this to me? Why am I suffering like this? Why am I dealing with this? Watch this. My pastor told me, because there's going to be somebody who's going to go through what you're going through and they're going to need your help. They're going to need your testimony to get through what they're going through. And and I promise you, I, I thought, it, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I didn't believe it, but I just could not see anybody else going through what I felt like I was going through. And I'm just like, okay, pastor, I hear you. It, it sounds good, man. If you say so, I, okay, I'm going to take it. I'm going to keep praying. And, and ultimately the season changed in my life and things turned around in different areas. And so uh, it, it was so powerful that seemingly every year I was encountering people in more than just every year, but I mean, it was like every other month I would be encountering people who were dealing with the same thing that the Lord had just brought me out of. I I mean, whether it was job, whether it was family, you know, whether it was finance, I mean, everything, it, it just seemed like everything that I had dealt with and come out of other people were going through and my phone was ringing asking me, man, how, Mills, how can I deal with this? I know you can tell me something to help me deal with. And it was just blowing my mind. I had to call my pastor back because I just could not believe that his words was coming true in my life. And that's essentially what David is saying right here, uh, because David says, if you do this for me, then I'll teach those transgressors your ways. And this is what I had to deal with because I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I was perfect. I'm not saying I was sinless or blameless, not at all. Uh, I w- I'm as human uh, just as much as I was trying to be saved. I was still human. 
And, and so what I was doing and had done and lived with, the Lord was now allowing people to enter my life that were dealing with the same things that I had just gone through. And I had to turn around and try to teach unto them and share with them and preach unto them and pray with them the same things that I had dealt with that the Lord would handle those same things for them that he had done for me. And, and it was only because I had begun to be honest with God about who I was and how messed up I was and how much I needed God to move in my life. And, and watch this. It was then and only then that after God moved, I was able to teach and share unto other people, other transgressors, if you will, as David says, I was able to teach them how to handle it but I was able to do it, you know, in a way that pleased God. It was not a, oh, you know, let's go have a drink. Or, oh, you know, the way to get from over one man is get under another. And it wasn't all that kind of foolishness. It was, hey, listen, the Lord just brought me through this. I've dealt with this and I'm going to tell you how I did it because the Lord, you know, showed it to me this way. This is how you need to pray. And this is what you need to be praying for. And you have to be honest with God about where you really are and what you're really doing. You can't hide it. And I had to begin to share my testimony with people who were in the same spot that I used to be in. And so it was only because I was honest enough with God in my repentant prayers. And I was, I had came to God the right way. I went to God. I suffered through the Lord brought me out. And I was able to go back then as David says, and be able to teach somebody else share with somebody else, encourage somebody else that they can get through it. They can come out of it. It's just like we said, if he did it for me, he can do it for you. That I, I, I want to say Ty Tribbett said, if he did it before, he can do it again. The same guy right now is the same God back then. And you have to know this. And the only way that you will know this is through being sincere and real and right with God. Uh, he says, watch this. Not only will I teach transgressions your ways, that, that, that means not only will I give unto them, God, what you've given unto me. He says, I'm giving them your ways. And his prayer is that they shall be converted to you. Catch this. David was not just praying uh, that people would be forgiven, that he would even be uh, forgiven, uh, but he was praying for their conversion. I need you to catch this. Uh, you, you do know uh, that it gets real when, when you're not only praying for a person's forgiveness, but you're praying for their conversion. What that means is that not only are you praying that they come out of what they're in, but you begin praying that they give their life, not just their situation, not just their problem, not just their circumstance, not just what they're going through, uh, but they begin to ask God uh, to not only take over their problems, but to take over their life. They, they truly surrender, not just the problems to God, but they surrender their spirit to God. And that's when it becomes powerful, brothers and sisters, that when it it becomes real. That's when it becomes relevant. When not only are you submitting my issues, my problems, my shortcomings, things that's bothering me and affecting me. When you're saying, not only do you take that God, but I need you to take this as well. I need you to take over and to be in charge and be the head of my life. When you begin to truly submit and surrender unto God, that's truly when you're converted into his child and then he can handle what you're dealing with. I sure wish we had time to really deal with the rest of this, uh, this particular number, but we got to go from now. Uh, but, but I want you to remember this. Um, not only uh, should you be honest with God about y your shortcomings, um, not only should you be honest with God about the things that you're dealing with and, and, and you're asking of him uh, to move on your behalf, uh, but, but be wise enough uh, to ask God, be spiritual enough to petition God and ask of him uh, to guard those who your sins may affect. That's what David is doing here. Uh, don't, don't let my sins uh, continue to affect others. And if it has, God, forgive them uh, because they're only operating under my, under my wisdom, under my words, under my leadership. And, and you have to be honest enough to say what I've done may have impacted somebody else. And, and you have to ask God uh, to not only, you know, forgive you and, to, and to, to bless you, but for those 
that have been affected by and even caused uh, 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 their lives to be changed. Uh, they begin to live a different life because of their fellowship of you or their connection with you. You have to begin to ask God for, for their forgiveness as well, because they may think they're on the right track. Uh, because you told them you go to church. And I say this all the time. Uh, most of us don't realize uh, that for a lot of people, we as close to God as they get. We, you know, we, we're the only Jesus that they know uh, is because we're the only one who talk to them about Jesus. And so if we talking to them about Jesus on one hand and then perverting their lives on the other hand, uh, then we are responsible for what comes out of them. The lifestyles they live, the blood is on our hands. And so David... Uh, is honest enough uh, to 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 say, God, I don't want it, and and that's kind of into verse number fourteen. I don't I don't want the guilt of this blood shed on me, uh, and and you know, and so you have to be wise enough to know that what you do and what you have done, uh, that 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 uh, it affects uh, other people. You write, Alonda, we are the only Bible that some people read, and this is why, uh, honestly, if you, I, I'm careful and cautious what I post on social media. I'm, I'm cautious of the things that I might say or do or, or, or you know, different things that I post uh, because some people see you in one light and then if they see you, uh, you know, post something different or say something different or, you know, all of a sudden I'm cussing on Facebook or what have you, then, you know, people begin to think it's okay uh, for them to start doing those things. And so you have to be wise enough to know that the life that you live directly impacts those people who are following you. And so you have to, you have to be spiritual enough to, to truly say, okay, God, not only handle me, but, but be kind unto those uh, who are following me and are living this way based upon uh, the decisions that they made following under my leadership, or following my friendship or what have you. And so you got to be careful. I say this all the time. Uh, kids ain't the only people watching you. It's some, it's some grown folk who should be smart enough, who should be closer to God on their own, uh, but, but they are relying on, on, your, on your relationship with God to help them with their relationship with God. And so you have to be wise enough to know uh, that, that you have to be careful of what you present uh, to other people. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done tonight. I'm, I'm praying that this lesson blessed you. Um, you, 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 we, we all get, have gotten to a point, and if you haven't lived long enough, stick around long enough, um, because you will get to a point, uh, because none of us are that holy uh, to where we're immune to sin and we're immune to bad decisions. You're right, Clay. We, we have to be careful to live what we preach, uh, but, but we have to get to that point to realize that we are not immune uh, from the temptations of sin, and so we have to be honest enough to truly admit our sins and, 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 and get to a point to where we really confess our sin. And so uh, I'm going to leave you with this and we're going to pray in a moment. Uh, I, I want you to get to a point, and I'm praying that you do, and, and I'm praying that I, I strive to continue to do so myself. I, I pray that we get to a point that we're honest with God in our prayers. There's so many of us uh, that have you know, we've said these cookie cutter prayers that we, you know, say stuff that we hear other people say, and our prayers are filled uh, with cliches and, you know, it, it's it's filled with, you know, just filler, but there is no true uh, sincerity in our prayers. There is no real, uh, true sense of, 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 of a real confession in our prayers. Uh, and honestly, every prayer that you, you know, every time you talk to God, it ought to be some confession in there somewhere because uh, honestly, all of us are sinners. I mean, it's, it, we're sinners by nature, by human nature. And so there ought to be a point in time in all of our prayers where some confession is made. And, uh, and so we got to get to a point to where we, we're honest in our prayers and honest in our approaches uh, with God. Uh, stop stop playing with, with God when it comes to this uh, because some of us are asked God to forgive us for something and turn right around as soon as we say amen and go right back to it. And, and we think that God is going to continue to have mercy upon us. Uh, you do know that all of us, are, you know, we're going to have a point where that sin catches up with us. And, uh, and, and so you have to be honest in our prayer. Be sincere in our prayer. Be real 
in our prayer. That's the only way that we're truly going to get to a point uh, to where God truly hears us um, and answers our prayers. The Bible says, if, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then shall I hear from heaven. Uh, it's a whole lot of us that are too proud to pray. We're too proud to even be honest and talk to God about who we are and, and what we really have done as though he don't know it already. Um, but we have to get to a point to where we are sincere in our prayers, honest in our prayers with God, and, and that we truly begin to live uh, in a manner that is pleasing uh, unto God. And so I told you all um, that we were going to pray before we leave. Um, and we're going to do that. So I want you all to, 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 I don't care if you send it to me uh, in a messenger, if you have my phone number, you can text it to me. Uh, I, I want us to get to a point that that every day we truly spend some time in praying. And I'm going to send this out in a message to the Puritan members uh, that we set aside some time every day at 6 p.m. Uh, every day at 6 p.m. Just pause and have a sincere moment of prayer every day at 6 p.m. Uh, pause and have a sincere moment of prayer uh, so that we can connect uh, with each other as well as uh, we can continue to push prayers to heaven. Um, the Bible says it. If my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. We have to get to a point where that we're truly uh, humbled in our approach to God, that we're real and relevant in our approach to God, uh, and, and that we are sincerely turning from the wicked ways that David was just talking about. Uh, we have to turn away from those things if we expect God uh, to truly move on our behalf. And so uh, I want us to do that at 6 p.m. I want us to start doing it every day, 6 p.m. Set it, set, set the, the, the alarm on your phone to go off just to pray. It ain't got to be all day. It ain't got to be all night, but just to set up some time that we can just pray, praying for our pastors and our church leaders, our church family, uh, for those family members and friends that you may have who are dealing uh, with this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, we know so many people, all of us know people who have been affected uh, by this, this pandemic. And so we, we certainly want to continue to pray for you uh, as well. We're praying for you. And then, I'll, of course, I say it all the time, but it bears repeating. Uh, we have to continue to pray for our doctors, uh, nurses and staff and things of that nature. I don't know if you all seen the article today. Uh, the, the, uh, the doctor, I think she's the president over uh, the largest hospital in, in Manhattan, uh, committed suicide. Um, and, and the story says that she could not take the pressures of being bombarded, uh, with the effects of this virus. And, uh, and it says that she committed suicide. And, and, uh, when we get to a point to where we feel like we can't take it anymore, we can't make it anymore. Something is wrong, uh, because we truly have to know that we serve a God that is able and capable of handling any and everything that we go through. I've, I've always said, and I want to say it again, there is nothing too big for God. There's no problem too strong for God. Uh, we serve an omniscient, all-knowing, an omnipotent, all-powerful God. And so we have to continue to know that we can put our trust in him, our faith in him, and he will handle this, okay? And so I want us to be prayerful. Go, as, we, as we prepare to leave here, I want us to be prayerful uh, for all of those. I pray that you all were blessed tonight. Uh, I pray that the word that was shared has, has ministered to your spirit. Uh, I said all, all the time, if you want to be a blessing uh, to our ministry, you can do so through Givelify. Uh, you can look up here to Avenue Baptist Church. You'll see a picture of the church. You'll see a funny looking fellow who looks like me. Uh, you in the right spot. You can share, you know, share your gift that way. You can drop it off to the church, 2351 Puritan Avenue, Detroit, Michigan, 48238. Uh, if by chance you just want to be a blessing to us, my prayer is that you are a blessing to your church first. Uh, and that if the Lord puts on your heart to be a blessing to us, God bless you. We'll receive it. We pray that the Lord gives it back unto you uh, 100 fold. All right. And so we want to be able to, to do that as well. Uh, I want to pray. I want us to pray tonight as always. And, uh, and then we'll let you go. So let's pray. God, again, we thank you for allowing us just these few moments to gather and to share uh, about your goodness and about how, how much you love us. And uh, God, we thank you. Uh, for continuously looking upon us and taking care of us, covering us uh, when we were unable to do so ourselves. God, we, uh, we come now uh, not just thanking you, not just praising you, but God asking that you would look upon us and look within us. God, we recognize that we have not lived sinless lives, but in fact, we've lived sinful lives. 
And God, even though we strive to do your will and we strive to be like you and what you wanted us to do, God, we, uh, we realize, God, uh, that we have fallen short and have missed the mark. And so we ask right now, God, uh, that you would forgive us, that you would look upon us and God sincerely forgive us uh, for those things that we have said, those things that we have done, the sins that we have committed against our fellow man. God, forgive us for those things we thought about, the, the things that we were plotting and planning on that didn't even come to pass, but we thought about it anyway. So God, we ask for sins of omission and commission that you would forgive us right now. God, we ask that you would restore your joy upon us and within us. Give us the right spirits to serve you and to worship you uh, as we strive to keep a sane mind in days and times such as these. We ask for your continued comfort and your continued peace in our lives. We ask now, God, as we prepare to close out this session, uh, God, that you won't let it be the last time that we're able to gather. Continue to allow us to assemble this manner until we can assemble back in the building. We ask that you bless all of us, keep us, cover us. Uh, maintain our lives, God. Keep order within our homes as only you can. As always, God, bless those who are dealing with this virus every day, those who have been infected, and God, those who have been affected. We ask that you bless them, touch them, heal them, make them whole as only you can. Bless now again, God, every doctor, every nurse, every nurse's assistant, every aide and staff member uh, that are heading to hospitals every day, every night. Uh, to work and to meet the needs of these, your people. We ask God that you would keep them in your uh, care and cover them, protect their minds and their spirits, protect them physically, uh, keep this virus away from them. God, if it be your will, we ask now that you move in a mighty way over our land, uh, that people would be saved, that people would be healed and people would be redeemed out of this situation. We ask now, you bless leadership of our churches, of our cities, uh, our local governments, our state government, God, even our national government. Uh, we ask that you give, a, give them sane minds, clear thinking, and a right of, to remember of who you are and, and that you truly hold all things in your hand. We thank you for what you've done. And God, we thank you for what you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name. We tell you thank you now and amen. God bless you tonight. I pray that this word has uh, touched you in some manner, some way, some form and that you can take this word, apply it to your lives, and then be a blessing to somebody else. Talk to you soon. Till next time.